What's up guys, Derek, moreplace18.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about Boston Lloyd's autopsy report. I don't actually have a copy. I'm going off of RX Muscles report, cause of death revealed autopsy report findings. Um, if we end up getting the full report in the future, if Leo is up to it, um, and if Steve uh, and him wanna make a podcast surrounding it, giving some information, elaborating on um, some more deeper insight and giving our interpretation of the actual report, then we'll do that. Just, you know, let us know if that's what you want to see. And, but I'm also mindful of the fact that this is like a really fucking touchy subject for certain individuals. Um, especially those very, very close to Boston, like Leo. So this is kind of like, I, I don't know, like maybe, it, maybe it will happen. Maybe it won't happen, but either way I saw this and I was obviously as interested as many of, as you are as to what happened, you know, like I had my speculation. He was borderline in kidney failure. Um, he needed to get a transplant. He was going to be getting dialysis. Um, he also had chronically high blood pressure. Like there was numerous things in addition to the, um, you know, experimentation, you know, that he did in the past, copious amounts of anabolic exposure, um, which I should reiterate, a lot of that stuff was not put on his clients. This is something that he did on his own accord to test the waters and see the truth about things because people are um, so tight to the chest about some of this stuff in the bodybuilding world. No one wants to say what they're really doing. Um, a lot of pe people downplay their use because they don't want to make it seem like they're genetically inferior or they didn't put the work in. So obviously this can lead to some skepticism when there are, you know, like top Olympians talking about like their 500 milligram test cycles and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, it's not like the, the real answer is they're all doing like five to 10 grams of shit. And Boston Lloyd learned that um, the hard way, unfortunately, but that is something that he brings forward as some, a legacy of sorts that he has imparted that information to prevent a lot of people from making the same mistake. A lot of people wouldn't know that more is not better if they didn't see him literally do it in real time. Like he's not genetically inferior. Like Boston is a pretty, you know, good responder from what I've seen personally. Like, you know, his first, you know, viral video of his like 21 year old steroid transformation that Chris Jones posted like way back in the day. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen that. And if you haven't, um, it's really, really mind boggling how drastic of a difference it was. It was like, I don't know how much muscle he put on, but it was under, uh, it was actually underneath Dave Palumbo, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that he did that initial transformation. But the original video here, epic one year steroid transformation, June, 2013. And in here, Chris Jones, you know, makes uh, statements about anabolic use. And, you know, this was like a, insane revolutionary thing at the time to see somebody being so transparent about their transformation like this was the before and the after like it was absolutely mind-boggling and i remember even me at the time like i wasn't on youtube but i saw this and i was like you know a spectator just like everyone else i was like holy fucking shit but again boston was transparent about the doses he took and the fact that you know he has a father who is a um like a very good bodybuilder, somebody who almost beat Gary Stridham in, uh, I believe it was the USA's or something. So it's not like he was a slouch in terms of genetics, but he did not have top tier Olympian genetics, but he would treat his body as an experimentation of sorts to see if it was, if it was really all drugs that got you up to the top. And he learned on like to the detriment of his own health, but fortunate for other individuals who don't have to go down the same road, more is not better. You know, he mentioned very transparently, he ran several grams of shit and there was a point of not just diminishing returns, but like counterproductive to the point where your body's so toxic, it's literally like working against itself. So this is something that I don't know who else would have fucking elucidated that so transparently and actually done these kind of like hardcore experiments to really reveal that that's what happens. But I think a lot of people are probably not going to go down that road that otherwise would have blasted their faces off. Guys at regional competitions who are on like, you know, a gram of trend because they think the reason they're not winning is just because they're not using as much as the guys who are beating them. When in reality, they probably just like shouldn't be bodybuilding competitively at the end of the day. And this is the kind of stuff to be mindful of too. And like be very, very 
unbiased on your objective assessment of yourself when you go into this sport that is it really worth it for what you're like how tolerant you are of drugs your response to the drugs where you're gonna have to put your body through and as well as having preliminary diagnostics which you know boston perhaps if he had those maybe he would have known that like obviously he would have done whatever he would have done anyways because of his you know personality and whatnot but i mean the average person if they found out they had like a cardiac um, like some sort of defect or dysfunction of some sort genetically, like perhaps they would not pursue bodybuilding so aggressively. Like even Antoine Viant recently, I've mentioned him a couple times now. He was like my inspiration when I was a teenager. Like this guy looked like the pinnacle of bodybuilding achievement from aesthetic and size perspective. And he was just like cool as fuck to watch and like very entertaining and something a lot of people, you know, aspired to, you know, emulate in some capacity. But again, who had Antoine's genetics? Like fucking nobody, dude. Like literally nobody <laughs> to a point where um, like the only guy who replicated his level of success in the sport and surpassed it is Regan, Regan Grimes, who was also a genetic phenom who was a big fan of Antoine and Antoine inspired him just the same to get into bodybuilding and pursue it. But again, these individuals, like they're not immune even themselves like these are individuals who are otherwise more potentially more tolerant to drugs than the next guy they respond better to the drug can actually make use of them but again when they get actual diagnostics like it's not always super clean even though they're you know young and healthy looking Antoine had the 99th percentile of plaque accumulation versus every other person on the planet the 99th percentile so that means of every 100 people he had worse um uh, plaque buildup than 99% of them, which is obviously a very, you know, start like a will literally make you shocked. You know, you would be holy shit. Maybe I need to reconsider what I'm doing. And it obviously put his, uh, you know, put him in check a little bit. Now, as far as I know, he's still pursuing the bodybuilding lifestyle, but being more mindful of certain things, uh, hopefully introduce the appropriate ancillaries for lipid modulation and change his diet accordingly and whatnot. And like maybe probably shouldn't be doing you know open bodybuilding at this point if he wanted to be like the most longevity minded but you know he's gonna do what he's gonna do and with boston again circling back to it this is i was kind of shocked to hear uh dave's um breakdown of exactly what happened because um well you'll see anyways let's get into it in florida you have to order an autopsy like a private autopsy if there's no suspicious cause of death which obviously there weren't it was in his house you know so they ordered an autopsy and the, the report came back and I don't think anyone would have ever suspected what the cause of death was. Um, I, I know I was kind of blown away by it. And it's, um, you know, it goes back to genetics. And I know people hate when I say that, but we're, we're all victims of our own genetics. Boston Lloyd died of a, a dissecting uh, aorta. And what that means is his aorta, which is the main artery that comes off the heart to provide blood to the body, which is the highest pressure um, artery in the body, um, can sometimes split. That's just the word dissect means. And if it splits, obviously the, the blood and that high pressure just blasts out of there. And usually you die very rapidly, you know, because you just bleed to death internally. And, you know, and then the, there's no blood being pumped to your brain or the rest of your body. And that's it. Now, in certain special cases, some people do survive. If you remember, Chris Dim um, had a dissecting aorta while he was in the gym. They rushed him right to the hospital, and, and he survived. He actually then had to go back, I think, believe it was a year or two later, and get his descending aorta, which had also had weakness, and they, and they went, attempted to correct that, and that's where he had, uh, became paralyzed. But he survived the first dissecting uh, aorta of his ascending aorta, and actually competed after that, and I believe qualified for the Olympia. So um, if you catch it, obviously, it's something that there's something that can be done about it. Now, I, I have an enlarged aorta, too, and I, you know, I get uh, cardiac CT angiogram sc scans every year just to make sure it's not increasing in size. And that's usually what they do when they identify that someone has a slightly enlarged aorta. They'll watch it because they don't want it to split. They don't want it to get to that point where it's too big, where it can be dangerously uh, in, a, in a bad sense. So like, I think a lot of bodybuilders would prevent premature deaths if they followed longitudinal data like this. Like Dave mentioned, how he's tracking actual metrics of size in his, um, with his cardiologist, presumably. Um, this kind of thing is 
like not just following blood work trends, because again, like liver enzyme elevation, transient changes, and you know, hematology, like this kind of stuff is insightful, but it's certainly not giving the full picture. But when you actually have like a breakdown of what's going on of the literal organ function, um, changes in morphology, function, et cetera, like this is giving a full picture of what's actually going on directly rather than, you know, something that only shows up on blood work when it's, you know, potentially, um, like far more problematic. Like sometimes this stuff doesn't manifest in actual like side effects until there's something going wrong. And then all of a sudden your blood work goes fucking like crazy because of a, any sort of, I don't know, like you're, you have like fucking actual kidney damage. And then all of a sudden you see your kidney markers because you haven't been getting, you know, things checked on a longitudinal basis or like way out of whack. But again, like on the way there, you know, checking everything from a structural standpoint, a functional standpoint, as well as the actual metrics reflected in your serum, like that would be the most insightful way to track how things are going in response to your anabolic exposure and any other compounds. And again, a lot of bodybuilders really abuse the fuck out of stimulants too. This is something I think needs to be taken a lot more seriously. The stimulant abuse, the adrenergic effect on the heart, um, as well as your brain too, in relation to all of the androgens compounded with the stimulant, stimulant use, unable to get into a state of, you know, parasympathetic rest and digest. You're always like perpetually like adrenaline fucking ridden. Like this kind of thing is like, I don't know how comparable it is to anabolic specifically, but it's also like throwing fuel on the fire for sure. Um, anyways, um, continue with uh, Dave's explanation. Now, Boston was only 29 years old, but his father, John Lloyd, who was also a bodybuilder, had a, an enlarged uh, aorta, also known as an aortic, an aortic aneurysm, and he actually had to have it surgically fixed. I don't know when he had it done. I think it was done in the last five years or so. And I know he had mentioned to Boston, hey, you know, you better get checked out because it can be inherited. You know, but, you know, who thinks, you know, at 20-something years old that you're going to ever have that issue? Now, I don't know if Boston ever went and got it checked. He did tell his father that he did, but, you know, we don't really know for sure. So... One thing I would point out is the fact that even his dad, you know, did use anabolics, but it was in a far more responsible and controlled manner. And it was acute exposure for his career. And then he got off from what I understand. And I don't know if he's actually on TRT right now or what, but like, obviously what he was doing was far less risky than what Boston was doing. And like, ultimately, you know, genetic predisposition to a point where you can even, like, I understand there is very important, um, it's very important to get baseline imaging. It's very important to get baseline blood work. All of these things are crucial, but following the longitudinal data is where you're going to see some of these like morphologic, um, structural, functional, et cetera, um, defects start to arise as they um, insidiously like develop over the years. Like these are things that are not going to be acute. Um, these are things that build up over time. And Boston has had uncontrolled high blood pressure for presumably like most of his 20s. The guy has not really taken a break significantly and even when uh you know he's done podcasts many times where he's discussed his like exceedingly high blood pressure um i actually had a friend i've talked about a few times on the channel who died at 21 years old from uncontrolled high blood pressure he had a blood clot in his leg dislodged killed him instantly that is something that totally avoidable again it wasn't a fucking genetic predisposition to high blood pressure perhaps it compounded it a little bit but i mean at the end of the day you know, what was he doing exactly? Something he was doing was elevating his risk to a point where it was still an avoidable outcome. It's not like his heart was like shit. It's not like his brain was shit. He literally had like viscous, thick ass fucking blood that built a clot up and then it dislodged and killed him instantly. Could have been totally avoided. Um, like he was, he knew he had high blood pressure, but unfortunately at the time, I was not even aware of how problematic that was. Like I was so primitive in my understanding of anabolics, risk, Anything. When you're 21, you're like, oh, I'm fucking invincible. Like, nothing's going to happen. 21 years old, dude, had a blood clot in his leg. His calf was, like, really fucking swollen and hurt. He didn't think anything of it. He thought he injured it at the gym. He took a few days off of work. One day at home, boom, done. That is the reality of this shit for some individuals who are, like, genetically predisposed. Because, again, genetic predisposition, you know, some guys can smoke the fuck out of cigarettes, drink all the time, and do things to their body that's incomprehensible and they live to 80, 90 years old. But some people, they won't. But ultimately, your organ durability, while it's partially genetically predisposed, expediting you to that end stage of whatever your predisposition is will be accelerated through your exposure to certain 
pharmacology, high body weight, uncontrolled high blood pressure. Like these are like the primary risk factors as far as I know for this um, aortic dissection. Like I'm pretty sure it's just like uncontrolled high blood pressure, high body weight. Like these things are all like classic um, complications that will eventually potentially lead to this. But again, this is and it, a pretty rare thing from what I understand. And it usually happens to guys in like their you know late 60s or 70s or something. And when it comes to the genetics, this is what Dave elaborates on further here. Um, I guess his mom is checking into his medical records to see if he ever did get a cardiac CT scan to check out that, um, that aorta to see if it was enlarged in any way whatsoever. Obviously having high blood pressure, training heavy and bearing down, doing the, that Valsalva maneuver in the gym where you kind of hold your breath a little to push heavier weights, that increases pressure in, in that aorta like a hundred times. And if you do have a weak aorta, genetically speaking, because it, it is a genetic you know, type of a, an abnormality or weakness, it could split. Now, does it normally happen in kids that are 29 years old? No, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen. And so despite Boston's crazy you know, protocols that he did, that we all know about, despite the fact that he was in kidney failure, None of these things seem to have contributed to his death other than the fact that you know he had just gotten back from the gym. Maybe he did a tough workout. Maybe the, the, the pressure of the workout um, just put too much stress on that AA order and it just gave out. And when he got home, that's what it hit him. You know, he started having back pain and he, he didn't feel right. And, and then he just lost consciousness probably because it was bleeding out inside of him. So like from what I understand, like one of the major complications of kidney failure, even if you're supportive with dialysis and whatnot, which he wasn't on yet, but he was planning on it, is like cardiovascular issues. This is something that just because you're on dialysis, which he wasn't yet, but even if you have like impaired kidney function, like this is not, this is going to be problematic for regulating um, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It's gonna be problematic for cardiovascular health. This is problematic for so many things in the body that are indirectly associated and the drug use is like, I feel like obviously directly implicated in this. Like his dad lived, is still alive and is living presumably like a high quality life right now um, because of his decision to step away. And like maybe his, I would speculate that some of his use may have expedited his, you know, issues too. Like, I don't think it's unrealistic to think that. However, what I do know is that individuals who take a step back and take active measures to attenuate the damage, we ha I have actually seen like structural regressions of like our LVH, like things like people in introducing nebivolol on after you know abusing shit, ending up with like cardiac remodeling in a positive direction, ending up like reducing the size and like actually getting to a point where it's more representative of um, normal heart dimensions and whatnot and improving the function of things. Like these are things that can be attenuated if you get in front of it early enough. So I don't know, like the whole genetic predisposition thing is kind of a, like I know, I don't know, like I feel like Dave highlights this almost like a little bit too much where he says like, oh, none of this was contributing directly, you know, like the kidneys, the, the high blood pressure can be contributive, but like, you know, the kidney damage, it actually had nothing to do with it and this and that, like, at the end of the day, as far as I know, like I dug into the aortic dissection a bit before this video just to see like what real genetic predispositions could really contribute. And it's more about like the actual structural integrity of the heart seemingly. So for example, um, well, there's individuals with Turner syndrome, high blood pressure and heart problems and other heart conditions may result from this disorder. But above and beyond that, like the main thing that would be concerning if you found out you had something, it's called Morphin syndrome. This is a condition in which connective tissue, which supports various structures in the body is weak. So people in this, with this have a history of aneurysms of the aorta and other blood vessels or family history of aortic dissections. Other connective tissue disorders includes Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, a group of connective tissue disorders that involve loose joints and fragile blood vessels and lois diet syndrome, which cause twisted arteries, especially in the neck. So again, did he have either of these things? I would be doubtful of it. However, I'm not ruling it out, but I'm just saying like to chalk it up to genetic predisposition when I think at the end of the day, the likelihood is much higher that he didn't have a connective tissue deficiency disorder or some syndrome that relates to lack of, you know, sufficient su structural integrity because, you know, his dad is, you know, doing okay as far as I know. And this is like clearly an accelerated outcome by drug use, in my opinion. Like, I don't think... Even if he had these syndromes, like, I mean, 
ultimately the drugs would accelerate you getting to the end stage of whatever like the worst outcome is possible that you could have in a faster time frame. Like I think it's like, I don't know how you could chalk it up to any kind of different outcome. Like there's so much data to reinforce this too. This is a paper on anabolic steroid use and aortic dissection in athletes, a case series. The use of anabolic steroids in super physiologic doses has grown in the last decade as doping drugs in athletes. The high dose of AAS causes cardiomyopathy, hypertension, thrombosis, myocardial infunction, infarction, weakness of connective tissue, notably, and it's, um, can't even say this word, CKLA, such as tendon injury and aortic dissection. Dissection of the ascending aorta is an uncommon injury that has been recognized with increasing frequency in bodybuilders in recent years. It has been proposed that such cases commonly accompany the weakening of connective tissue and must be actively evaluated in the presence of anabolic steroid usage. Now, again, like even when you think about anabolic steroid use, how many times have you heard about how, you know, the tendons won't keep up with your muscle growth? You know, things like it's your increased chance of injury when you take anabolics because your muscle grows so fast relative to the like load imposed on it, but your tendons don't necessarily catch up the same at any like comparative rate. Like when your heart has increased demand for even like oxygen, nutrients, you know, blood and shit, this is something that is going to put increased demand on it. This is something that when you have anabolic exposure, uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone manipulation through these anabolic compounds and you're not addressing it properly, um, super physiological doses, the actual body weight being increased by these doses, the water retention that's associated with it. These are all problematic to a point where you're going to increase the stress on the connective tissue, even if it's not a like syndrome induced, like deficiency of connective tissue causing a structural defect. Rather, you are imposing this connective tissue dismantlement essentially. From what I understand, it has been proposed that such cases commonly accompanying the weakening of connective tissue must be actively evaluated in the presence of anabolic steroid use. We present a case series of isolated ascending aorta dissection athletes who were bodybuilders. All cases were evaluated by trans or trans, holy shit, this is a hard one, transthoric kick echocardiography and laboratory exams. These cases also served as a reminder of the risk of ascending aorta dissection with AAS especially in strength athletes who place high demands on their musculo musculoskeletal structures. The results of the current study suggest that anabolic steroid use may be associated with detrimental effects on the myocardium represented as myocardiomyopathy or atherosclerotic changes in the coronary artery as myocardial infarction. These findings also strongly suggest that anabolic steroid treatment predisposes the individual. Anabolic steroid treatment itself predisposes the individual to aortic dissection, especially when the patients are exercised. So here, down the discussion, one of the side effects of anabolic steroid use is literally aortic dissection, which is associated with hypertension and atherosclerosis. Chronic steroid use may cause fragility of the vessel because of the negative effect of the anabolic steroids on collagen formation and connective tissue strength. So, and there's some compounds that have actual direct implications on collagen formation. So circling back to Dave's video, like I don't know if his intention was to like actually highlight the genetic predisposition so aggressively, but I've seen this in some of his like previous autopsy report finding videos too, where he like the Dallas McCarver thing, like it was pretty strongly implying that it was like genetic rather than the gear when it's like, like, no, if he did not weigh 300 pounds and didn't use, he was natural the entire time, like guarantee fucking T he would be alive right now. Obviously I can't guarantee it, but I mean, I would be strongly strongly thinking that he would still be here. Maybe he's not the most genetically blessed person from a fucking like thyroid cancer and this and that standpoint. But I mean, there are certain like manually imposed limitations on oneself that you make when you expose yourself to this shit, when you crank your body weight up that significantly, when you get the 300 pounds, like this is not something that is, you know, you were just going to get there no matter what. Like, no, like I'm pretty sure a lot of this is like manually imposed on oneself. Very sad death, obviously, because this is something that theoretically, you know, potentially could have been avoided. Um, this is an acute type of situation. It wasn't due to any chronic damage that he had done, you know, over the years. Although, you know, having high blood pressure and stuff like that, obviously, is, is not good for that situation. But not usually doesn't, you know, catch up to you at 29 years old. So, Like, I would think it's one of the main reasons, personally. I don't know. So, uh, Look, you know, I always say, you never know when your last day is, you know, and so Boston lived his life like every day was his last day and he lived it to its fullest. He loved what he did, you know, and he lived, you know, a hard life, but 
you know, in the end, he actually succumbed to something that was unrelated pretty much to everything else he had going on. And once again, we can't escape our genetics, and that's why it's very important to go for diagnostic tests. I can't stress that enough. And that's what his mom really wanted me to impart to our audience, to my audience. Like, I don't really understand because it's like he's almost making it seem like if you, there was no change imposed by the drugs or the lifestyle or anything, like even if you get the diagnostics, like aren't you pretty much just finding out you're going to die at 29 then? Because that's like that sounds like what's being implied here, which I would be shocked if that's what he actually thinks. Like I would think even he like I would think he would understand like, OK, if Boston was totally natural, never ate copious amounts of food never imposed these like recreational drugs upon himself, never used experimental compounds, never did this, never did that, was just like a natty fucking bodybuilder this entire time. Like what is the likelihood that he would be in any like state of poor health at 29? Like, like I would assume he'd probably be to pretty fucking fine right now, to be honest. So like, I'm, I don't know, like am I misinterpreting what he's saying? Like it seems wildly inaccurate to me. Like I would say this is directly from the fucking drugs and the lifestyle. And you need to be cautious of this. You need to, like he said, you need to get your diagnostics. But I mean, like at baseline when you're natty, like your diagnostics probably look pretty fucking clean in your 20s. This is something you have to, you know, consistently follow. Uh, which he would obviously, he would reinforce, I would assume. That's like what he said in the video. But then at the same time, it's like a bit contradictory to his imply that the lifestyle and shit was not like directly related to it. Like this is literally what got him here, you know? The impairment of, you know, collagen formation, like literally in the fucking data, you have anabolic steroid users getting cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarction, this, that, high blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. Like this is something like the high risk of atherosclerosis. Fuck. Like the guy was chronically high blood pressure. Like I think it's goes without saying that this is something you need to be very mindful of. Like if you're predisposed, it doesn't mean like you're going to die at the same age if you take the shit, you know, like don't, this is the thing. Like if you were predisposed and you see like aberrations in your blood work like so significantly or malfunction or structural changes in like an aberrant and like very very expedited time frame or even at all from what you're doing like maybe that's the sign to like not fucking do it you know not that you're going to die at the exact same age regardless like it's expediting you getting to whatever your genetic predisposition is like from what i would that's what i'm gathering i don't actually have the autopsy report i'm just going off of what he's saying maybe we'll get more insight when we get the report but i mean from a outsider perspective, just like objectively reacting to what he's saying that was on the report, like to me, that's what my interpretation would be. To all the fans and all the bodybuilders out there is that don't take your health for granted. Look, Boston died unnecessarily. You know, he, he could have gotten a kidney transplant and lived a very long life. You know, this was something that was unexpected, but his dad had warned him. He obviously had it, ran in the family. A simple cardiac CT angiogram could have, you know, identified that and then he could have, you know, made adjustments or gotten it fixed if it was something that was big enough that warranted it. His father got it fixed and he's doing fine. So, you know, at some point I might need to get mine fixed. I don't know. I hope not. I hope mine never gets any bigger than it is and that's why I keep an eye on it. But I'm not going to just not deal with it and then one day I'm going to walk into my house and drop. You can't do that. You have to be aware of whatever health issues you have, whether it be genetic or something that you caused yourself, it doesn't matter because the result is the same. You have to you have to keep tabs on it. Okay, so I think the ending is basically just like a warning to keep tabs on your shit, which is good. I don't know. This is like a weird, like contradictory message being elucidated here by him. It's just like nothing he did was impactful of the end, end result, but at the same time, keep an eye on your shit because you could make the appropriate changes if you knew ahead of time. So I don't know. Let me know what your guys' interpretation is. Ultimately, I think there was significant direct impacts from what he was doing to his health, and it is possible to die in your 20s on this shit if you're not careful. So, you know, obviously, boss is an extreme outlier. Most people are, are probably going to take his case as, oh, well, like, I don't do nearly the shit he does, so I'll be fine. Like, I just did a video on a 26-year-old the other day who just fucking had cardiac arrest um, from presumably the lifestyle, too. Like, this is something that's happening not just to the prominent, you know, famous people, like there's people behind the scenes that end up with like permanent issues from this stuff if you're not careful. And yeah, the genetic predisposition is, is real in some people. Like there are individuals who will end up with cardiac arrest at 26 if they go through this lifestyle. 
And there are individuals who, you know, maybe you could have avoided it a bit longer if you had the proper, you know, attenuating ancillaries and, you know, diagnostics and shit. Or you would have known that you're so severely predisposed that maybe you shouldn't touch the shit at all. But you would only know that if you get elaborate diagnostic testing and stay on top of your shit. So, um, yeah, proper ancillaries, proper blood work, proper diagnostics, addressing blood pressure, like obvious things. Like you're not going to end up with an aortic dissection as a normal, healthy person without collagen, like malfunctioning collagen formation syndromes, like you're a, a normal functioning human will be fine. It's the anabolic steroid use and the other drug use that is contributing in this case, in my opinion, for the most part, you know, high body weight, high blood pressure. Like this is, this is stuff to be taken seriously for sure. So anyways, if we get the full report, I'll give a more detailed breakdown if Leo's up to it with Steve. I don't know if maybe I'll just do it with Steve. Depends, you know, remains to be seen. But that's the video for today. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.